Hey there, everyone. Happy July and welcome to The Final Bar. It's Monday, July 1st, and I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action using the power of stock charts, a tool designed to empower investors to better understand the markets and to apply the uh, tools of the technical analysts. June is now over, which means Q2 has now wrapped, and it was a pretty decently strong month for risk assets. The uh, major averages at or near new all-time highs. The question is the sustainability of that move. July ends up being one of the strongest months of the 12, if you go back to the 2009 low. We'll talk about a little bit of seasonality, a little bit of a major benchmark, the S&P 500 stalling out. A lot of movement underneath the hood with some leading growth names pushing higher, some consumer names pulling back and a lot more to uh, cover. With that in mind, let's get right to our market recap and focus on how the markets evolve to start Q3 of 2024. As we can see here from our uh, market overview, the S&P 500 up about of a quarter of a percent, we'll call it, to close just above 54.75. The Nasdaq composite even better, up 0.8% from yesterday's close. The Dow just slightly higher, mid caps and small caps both in the red. So once again, the biggest names, the largest names, the biggest sectors doing the best. The smaller names, the uh, less big sectors, for lack of a better term, uh, are struggling a little bit more. So the mid-cap S&P 400 is your worst performer, down about 1%. The VIX continuing to bring uh, pull back just a little bit, still right above uh, 12. We'll call it 12 and a quarter. So the VIX down in that low teens range means low volatility, low uncertainty. Market conditions pretty strong. Here you can see the uh, long bond yield up to around 464. The 10-year point around 450, just below there, 448, we'll call it. Five-year point around 444. Now, if those numbers seem a little higher than they were end of last week, that's because they are. Today, we actually saw uh, bond prices gap lower. The TLT was down about 1.7% and interest rates pushing uh, very quickly to the upside. So we had a bit of a gap higher, nearing 4.5%. We'll look at the chart of uh, the 10-year yield here in a few moments uh, if we can. The dollar index, no real change from Friday's close. Looking at the commodity space, mostly in the green, you can see gold and silver prices higher, copper prices higher, Crude oil price is doing just fine. The USO, which is a crude oil ETF, uh, finished the day up about 2.5%. Looking over in crypto land, you know, up slightly today, but over the course of the weekend, you saw things rotate higher. If you look at the last uh, 24, 48 hours, you can see Bitcoin came down to almost exactly 60,000 before rotating higher. I can't say this enough, but I with with uh, with most risk assets, right, with most most freely traded assets like a stock, an ETF, a cryptocurrency, uh, whatever, a commodity, you will find more often than not they gravitate to big round numbers. And if you think that's just a made up thing that I'm saying, there's been academic research that has been done about how orders tend to be clustered around big round numbers. And that could arguably be a big human component because we tend to just naturally look at those big round numbers and think that it has meaning, if, even if it may not need to have a certain meaning. If we expect it enough and if we put enough orders there, markets are going to turn right around that big round number. So here yet again, we see Bitcoin coming right down to 60,000 and then popping right back to the upside. So with cryptocurrencies in particular, I'm finding it to be uh, happen very, very frequently, particularly at those 10,000 increments on uh, something like Bitcoin. We're currently around 63,340 here as we wrap the uh, equity trading session. Looking at the, uh, let's see, the 11 S&P sectors, you can see technology number one up 0.8%, consumer discretionary, number two, just over a third of a percent higher, financials are third top performer, uh, up about 0.2% within tech and consumer. We have some large names doing well, like a Tesla, like Apple, these are stocks doing uh, particularly well here on Monday, and that is uh, rocketing those sectors up to the top of the leaderboard. On the downside, materials down 1.5%. Industrials down just over 1%, about the same for REITs, down about uh, 1% as well. The market trend model that I like to uh, talk about using weekly data and using exponential averages to sort of uh, you know, create those uh, that model. You can see that as of Friday's close, the mid-cap model uh, still short-term negative. All the rest of my market trend model back to a sort of bullish across the board reading, including our main model, which is the S&P 500s. 
Looking at the Magnificent Seven and Friends, these leading uh, growth names, you can see Tesla actually at the top of the list, and that has not happened too often recently. It's been others like Meta and Alphabet and others that have tended to be at the top of the uh, of the list. Tesla actually up another 6% today. We'll look at that chart here in a moment, along with Apple up 2.9%, Microsoft up 2.2% as well. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500. Let's look at what happened today. And to be honest with you, after all that talk about things doing great and things bouncing higher and things leading, look at the S&P just literally range bound here. And if you go to a, just a short term chart here, looking at the last couple of weeks, look at how after that gap higher and there's that shaded area just sort of highlighting that gap when we gapped above 5400 for the first time. We then had another week of essentially moving higher. There was that big day kind of midweek a couple of weeks ago where we pushed the upside. But from that moment on, that was the day of the of the that was the uh, the closing level right around 5475. That was on the 17th. If you look at where we're at now on July 1st, we literally closed at almost the exact same level. So over the last two weeks, essentially, we have gone nowhere. We have been between 5450 and 5500 and change. And overall, we remain range bound. So this sort of narrowing of the volatility, which is what we've seen, right? The VIX has come down. It's in the low 12s. The S&P is definitely sort of in a short term range bound situation. Um, you know, at some point that's going to break, right? And in the tactical time frame here, just looking at the last couple of weeks, we break below 5450 or we break above 5500 and sort of hold that. I think a little bit wider, uh, 5400 is the level, right? That's that gap uh, low that we've highlighted here on our daily chart. That's that pink shaded area here. It also lines up with the pink trend line using the major lows over the last uh, 12 months. So, you know, S&P above 5,400 is just nothing but pretty good. Um, it's great if we can get above 5,500, get a close above there for the first time and just see additional buyers pushing risk assets above that level. But for now, sort of long and strong hanging in there, uh, hanging in there just fine. You'll note the RSI was uh, overbought for much of the month of June. It's actually come off a little bit just below that uh, 70 level. But uh, overall, again, the S&P holding up here. And as a trend follower, I'm going to assume that that trend of higher highs and higher lows is in place until proven otherwise. So a break below 5,400 for me would certainly change my tune and have me thinking about a much more elevated chance of a further retest of, uh, of support levels going to, uh, to the downside. Do want to take a moment and just share with you a quick seasonality view. What we have to remember after now we've wrapped June is July is actually an incredibly strong month. So what I'm going to do is start last year and go back to the 2009 low. So I'm starting in 2010 and I'm going through 2023. So basically ignoring 2009, which was the bottom, ignoring the current year, which is obviously uh, you know in, in progress. So if we look at that previous basically 14 year uh, stretch, Note that the three top uh, set, uh, three top months in terms of batting average, right? In terms of how what percent of the time they were up, it's April, July, and November. Obviously, April was pretty decent this uh, year as well. We did have a major low in April, but the the month ended actually quite strong. November makes sense because you often have a major low in September and or October. That's actually happened most uh, years uh, in the last five years. So reasonable to expect a nice bounce off of that point. But the third one is July and July and November almost exactly the same in terms of their average return, just over 3% for the month and their uh, head rate, which is almost 90%. So most of the time, July is a strong month. And uh, generally speaking, the average returns have been way above uh, average. Uh, so you know, it, 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 it expecting a major uh, top in June and then a rotation lower would be fighting this pretty decent seasonal trend. So I'm going to assume that July is pretty strong because it's always been strong here. If you go back to the 2009, almost always, the average returns have been very, very good. But note that August and September are a lot weaker. And I think what we may be setting ourselves up for is that classic summer high. We've had a peak most years in June, July, or August. Doesn't appear that June was really the you know the 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 peak for now. We'll see. But given the strength in July, maybe we're setting up for that July peak before we rotate lower in uh, August and September. And again, that has been a pretty consistent and classic bet of weakness going into the fall. And given the strength we've saw, saw in the first half of the year, I, I would be hard pressed to expect anything other than that. So let's say we do start to rotate lower. Where might you look for a downside target? I was doing some Fibonacci analysis 
uh, for my premium members over the weekend, just sort of thinking about some downside scenarios. You know, again, we already have a playbook of what would tell us maybe that a downside uh, uh, move is happening. The question is where we might go there. And what I noted was if you take the October 23 low and the June 24 high, let's assume that was the peak that we saw last week. I don't think we can say that with any with any confidence just yet, but let's assume that it was just for argument's sake. 38.2% of the way down is just below 5,000, which would be right around that April low. So if we would go back and retest the April low, that would be a perfect kind of Fibonacci classic retracement down to the first down, uh, objective uh, given a uh, given a major top. So food for thought, if we do get a rotation lower, Fibonacci analysis for now sort of lining up with some major lows uh, going back in uh, in previous cycles. I do want to highlight here another chart looking at uh, the new Dow theory. So this is a, you know, just the S&P 500 in the top panel, the NASDAQ in the bottom panel. I was uh, preparing for my monthly chart review with my premium members at Market Misbehavior coming up tomorrow. And uh, uh, one of the things we'll talk about is sort of the, uh, you know, the, the general conditions as defined by cap weighted versus equal weighted measures. The cap weighted benchmarks, the S&P and the NASDAQ made clear new all time highs in June. But if we go to the very next chart in the uh, Mindful Investor Live chart list, it's the equal weighted S&P 500 and the equal weighted NASDAQ 100. Note how both of these actually made their all time high in March. Neither of them have made a new all time high in the second quarter. And I think that's very telling that the cap weighted indexes and the equal weighted indexes all were strong in March. Now the cap weighted indexes remain very strong at the end of June, but the equal weighted ones are much lower. We've talked a lot about the breadth conditions that are not particularly supportive of this current market environment. That's one of the ways I uh, just sort of came up with over the weekend was digging into a little bit to demonstrate that uh, discrepancy between the uh, benchmarks moving higher, but a lot of individual stocks not necessarily looking nearly as strong. Another measure of market breadth to, uh, to highlight will be the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average, which today actually dinged, uh, dinged a little bit lower here. So even though the uh, S&P and the NASDAQ finished positive, uh, this measure of breadth actually rotated a little bit lower today. So you now have down to around 42% of S&P 500 stocks remaining above their 50-day moving average. So to be clear, in the last couple of weeks, as we've been sort of range-bound uh, after uh, bouncing higher in that first chart of the S&P, we sort of had the gap higher a couple weeks ago, and then we've been sideways. On that gap higher, we got to around 60% 60, uh, 60 of the S&P members above their 50-day moving average. As of today's close, that's down to 42%. So while the S&P has been holding steady, a lot of individual stocks have been pulling back. I think that's a cause for concern. Again, this is one of those that isn't really reflected in the price of the index itself, but it certainly is uh, is uh, is clear when you look a little bit further uh, into uh, into uh, I guess underneath the hood of the markets. I mentioned the bonds had traded lower today, and that's causing rates to go higher. And you're certainly seeing that here today. Ten-year yield finished the uh, uh, previous week around 435. Today we went up uh, about a full, um, uh, uh, well, I guess a point. 0.1 on the uh, on the yield, so up to around four and a half percent from 4.4 percent for 435 to around 445 is what I would call it, uh, basically call it. So we really pushed higher today, and as you can see, we're testing trend line resistance. So if we take a trend line here using the recent peaks, we'll take this one and connect it there. You can see that's sort of the upper end. I'm going to uh, take a uh, parallel version. Sorry, I drew a couple too many lines. See, I'm drawing this sort of downtrend channel. It's a common trend line technique. You have the, uh, you know, in a downtrend, you want to measure the highs and see where they're at. You can see the April high and the May high line up to around 4.5% this week. But if I draw a parallel line, you can see that lines up really well with the lows in May and June. So we have a clear downtrend channel. And so what you look for here is when the channel is broken, which means 10-year yield around 5, we'll call it 453 or so, and get above that trend line resistance. That could indicate much further rates going through in the month of July. And maybe that sets us up for that major market top, I don't know. Uh, but certainly rates going up would be a very different environment than what we uh, saw in Q2. Q2 mostly has been uh, rates coming down. I think that has certainly allowed growth stocks to thrive because that is a, a, a pretty decent environment uh, for those types of names in particular. As we see rates go higher, I think that's one of the risks of this uh, current market environment. Certainly something to, uh, to watch as growth stocks have been outperforming for, uh, for quite some time now. 
Let's finish off the uh, the show here looking at some individual stocks. I do want to highlight Waste Management is one of the names actually showing a bearish uh, engulfing pattern. We have a couple of these today. Maybe go through a couple of these here today. Uh, WM Waste Management uh, having a bearish engulfing pattern. It's worth noting this was actually one of the 10 charts to watch that we highlighted on uh, Friday's show. Grace and Rose and I went through 10 stocks. You know, a bit of a, of a change today with this bearish engulfing pattern. I think what's worth noting is that as, as this stock is testing previous resistance, so we're testing the high from March. Again, the test the, uh, in April, we're sort of right back up to that level. And what we talked about was breaking out above resistance would be a very clear bullish sign. Today, we're not getting that. You're actually seeing a bearish moment, a bearish uh, engulfing pattern. It's not the end of the world, necessarily speaking. Usually, a, a bearish engulfing pattern like this tells you about the next one to three bars. But it is worth noting, in my opinion, as we test a key resistance level, we get that sort of candle pattern. It tells you maybe to wait and see and see how this pullback digests. I'm immediately looking down to the 50-day moving average. We didn't quite get there today. But see if that's able to hold and maybe set us up for the uh, for the next leg higher there. Speaking of bearish engulfing patterns, another one to highlight would be MGM, another one, you know, showing real strength on uh, Friday. We'll look at the longer term chart here in a minute, but just so you see that pattern as a, as a reminder, bearish engulfing pattern is a two candle pattern where you have a big up day and a big down day. And it's called a bearish engulfing pattern because you look at the body of the candle, which is the open to close and here are the open to the close day two, the down day, the open to close range of the body of the candle engulfs the uh, body of day one. So big up day, big down day, day two, a bit of a wider range. And that usually signifies major distribution from day one to day two. Again, it's more of a one to three uh, kind of bar uh, type of outlook. This is a short term uh, signal. However, I think it's worth noting after the run higher it is showing some short term distribution. I'd be looking down to the moving average support. That's a level where we've sort of been, uh, you know, toying around with for quite some time here on uh, MGM. MGM, we talked about last week because these gambling stocks had really had incredible runs after making a new swing low in May, had really rotated higher. MGM came on my radar because of this bullish momentum divergence, lower lows in May, higher lows in momentum. You can see we then made a higher low around 39 and then rotated higher. So today's bearish engulfing pattern tells you short-term weakness. And that's after being overbought for the first time in a couple months on uh, on Friday's, uh, Friday's session. So keep an eye on that one. Other stocks showing some short-term weakness today. That was a mouthful. Uh, AutoZone Nevada, AZO. This is part of the uh, auto parts group. You know, generally these stocks had really decent uh, uh, moves Earlier in the month of June, going into the end of, uh, of Q2, you saw some weakness, right? You saw uh, AutoZone get up to around 30, 50, and then rotate lower. We bounced off the 50-day moving average. Today, though, really dropping significantly, around 4.5%. Uh, to the downside, this is one of the worst performing uh, members of the S&P 500. I would be watching that 200-day moving average, the swing low from May. You can see this last pullback. We found support at the 200-day, and that set us up for a nice bounce higher. I'd keep an eye and see if that uh, sort of stable uh, level is able to happen. We also have to talk about cruise line CCL moving lower today as well, over 5% to the downside. What's interesting about Carnival and uh, MGM and others they're testing resistance, right? Waste management was the one I meant. We're testing resistance, right? So uh, it's even longer term looking at Carnival, right? You had the peak in July of 2023, December of 23, all sort of in this 19 to 20 range. We get back up to that level over the last week. We finally sort of got back within the range of those peaks. And now we get this uh, sort of big down move off of that resistance level. So charts like this, I think, can be very constructive if they trade not just to resistance, but through resistance. For now, some of these names that were very close to showing a nice upside breakout actually starting to stall out a little bit. I would argue that's actually a cause for concern here as we go into the month of, uh, of July. In a traditional bullish phase, when conditions are strong, stocks, generally speaking, are probably going higher and stocks actually tend to have good breakouts, right? They get to resistance and they break higher because investors are adding risk and they're adding to positions that are starting to work. When we have failed breakouts, we have stocks that attempt to break out but 
that stall or we have stocks that get to resistance but don't actually break through it, not only is that a concerning sign for the individual stock, but it could be part of a larger sign that there's less uh, money being put to risk. There's less uh, investors out there looking to uh, ride a carnival to the next leg higher. That often can be a bit of a risk off signal for the markets in general. So keep an eye on some of those charts as well. Let's go out on a high note and look at some of the stocks actually getting it done. They tend to be in a couple of sectors, consumer discretionary and technology, which are top performing sector uh, here today. Although I do have a bank to uh, throw in here in a moment. Tesla, one of the top performing names in the S&P, back above the 200-day moving average for the first time since early January. We can see we're another 6% uh, percent higher, finally getting above a $200 a share. That's where we stalled out in April. So I think getting above there today is pretty important. We close above the 200-day moving average. For me, it's all about tomorrow and what we call the concept of follow-through. Do we see additional buyers willing to not just push Tesla higher today, but willing to uh, take additional bets that the uh, uh, the stock is uh, continuing on to test resistance more in the mid upper 200s. That's the question for Tesla. But overall, I like the breakout. I like the rotation higher. I think making higher lows along the way would be a nice way to sort of confirm that upward swing that we're seeing in a name that's really been underperforming some of the other uh, leading growth names. Other leading growth name to talk about, Apple. Apple, of course, uh, resistance around 195 here uh, last year. You can see we tested that again. We finally broke above there with authority last month. From there, though, we stalled out a bit. You can see the higher low around 206. That's what I like about this chart. We're rotating back higher, but now we have a clear, what I call a natural stop. A natural stop for me is you look at the chart and there's a clear low just sticking right out there that you could say, all right, if I take a position today, I put a stop there, I'm minimizing my downside risk. I'm taking advantage of any upside beyond what we've seen so far. I like the move in Apple, particularly the higher low around 206. And I think as long as we hold that uh, currently, that's a pretty good chart outperforming big time in uh, the second quarter. Uh, CrowdStrike, we'll say within the technology sector and show this one. You know, this one's up another 2.3% today, which is a nice uh, follow through. But just like the S&P 500, this is a stock that's sort of uh, stalled out a little bit, right? You see the gap higher when we gapped above 360. That took us above the March and May highs. I think that was a great gap. But from there, we really haven't followed through. So it's not coming down. It's not a bad chart, but it's really not continuing to push too much to the upside. I'd love to see CrowdStrike get above 400 to sort of complete that rotation. You've got a natural stop at the upper end of that uh, of that uh, gap, currently around 370, we'll call it, uh, but overall a nice setup. And finally, the financial sector, why not here? Goldman Sachs bouncing off of an ascending 50-day moving average. This is the type of chart you love to find, right? A stock uh, making new swing highs or attempting to do so above two upward sloping moving averages. I like this sort of natural pullback to 440 to the 50 day moving average. That means, you know, as long as you limit your downside to there, you're betting on the fact that Goldman could actually break out. And I think getting above 470 for me would sort of validate that upswing. So I think a break to a new swing high. RSI getting above 60 on that push higher would really confirm uh, a, uh, a next leg higher for uh, for Goldman Sachs. But for now, kind of a nice pullback to an ascending 50-day moving average in a bullish market. Those are the types of names and the types of opportunities I like to look for. Folks, that's it for the show today. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. We've got some adjusted programming this week and next. We've got the 4th of July holiday, so no show Thursday and Friday. We've got some special programming for you next week, but we look forward to bringing it all to you. For Stock Charts and Redmond Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.